Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Patrick Milliken, and uh, it is a real treat to have uh, Heather Young here with us today. She's going to be discuss discussing her really fantastic new novel, uh, The Distant Dead, uh, with Ivy Pakoda, and I got it right this time. I made a complete ass of myself uh, last week talking to Ivy when I, I introduced her and pronounced her name wrong, so I'm making up for that. I uh, my new <laughs> a new friend, Ivy Pakoda, who, if you haven't read her, uh, she's, I think, one of the, the most talented uh, writers at work today. And her new book, uh, These Women, I kind of droned on and on about how it, uh, I thought it was, um, you know, a major contribution to the literature of LA. And I absolutely think that's true. And when I was talking with Michael Connolly uh, last week, he, he said, wow, I just read this new, great new book called uh, These Women. And just when I think I've read it all, you know, when it comes to the LA crime novel, uh, you know, he was impressed. So Thank you. We, we sang your praises. Very high praise. So, so Ivy has, uh, has uh, um, agreed to come and kind of talk to Heather about her new book. And I, I uh, will be standing on the sidelines mostly, but I might pop in with a, an annoying question or two for both of you. But um, Heather, let me give you the, the, uh, the formal intro which is kind of short, but it says, uh, Heather is the author of two novels, the, the award and Edgar nominated The Lost Girls and the forthcoming, which is now out, uh, The Distant Dead. Uh, she holds an MFA from the Bennington Writing Seminars, uh, a fellowship from the Suwannee Writers Workshop and, and is an alumnus of the Squaw Valley Writers Workshop and the Tin House Writers Workshop. But none of that hurt her. She's, uh, <laughs> no, I managed to survive all that. <laughs> Just uh, to write crime novels. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. Uh, she lives in Mill Valley, California, where she writes, bikes, hikes, and I love this part. Uh, she reads books by other pe people that she wishes she'd written. Uh, and then I add, you've also practiced law in San Francisco uh, before starting this career. So you're a chronic underachiever, is what you're saying. <laughs> um, I can uh, stick with anything. <laughs> but Ivy and Heather, welcome. Uh, it's really great having you both with us today. Thanks, Patrick. Um, hi, Heather. Hi, hi. Um, before we started, um, when the three of us were chatting, um, Patrick was talking about how much he loved this book and had read the opening chapter aloud to his wife, um, which is um, a way to introduce how absolutely fantastic The Distant Dead is. Um, I really struggle, if for anyone watching who doesn't know, Heather and I have known each other, um, I don't wanna say how long, because we graduated from, we went to graduate school together, we were in the exact same class, the same workshops, which is really unusual. So probably more than anyone else at graduate school, I studied with you the most. Yes, that's true. With the same teachers both times too, yep. so we had a very similar <laughs> experience. Um, all of that is a roundabout way of saying that I find it very difficult to read books by people I know because I can't put myself outside of that, you know, the headspace of this is Heather's book. As I told you in an email, I was so transported when I read the first 40 pages of this book, and not to say the subsequent 300 were <laughs> any drop off, <laughs> that I had to write you an email saying, I just absolutely love this um, book for many, many reasons that we're going to talk about. But it's a true accomplishment. Um, and uh, congratulations, um, i really impressed. Thank you, yes. Um, I, you're a bit ahead of me in terms of book writing, but you may remember the second book, writing the second book is really, really hard. Like you managed to grind out that first book and then people turn around and say, when's the next one coming? And you have to deliver it to them in some period of time that is less than seven and a half years. And it has to you know, be successful and it has to be all those things. And I found it to be extraordinarily um, stressful to write the second book. Well, that sort of introduces my first question. Um, so I know, because you and I shared a similar experience in my work, the book we call my first book, there's like secretly this other book that sort of got written out of the situation. <laughs> but the first book that anyone really noticed, you and I um, were workshopping these books together in graduate school, and neither of us, as far as I can remember, thought we were writing crime novels, yeah. right? Your, your book was initially titled White Earth. It was a family saga. My book was like a real tough New York story about people getting drunk in bars. It was like Ivy's Paul Auster trilogy. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so, um, but I think you had a similar experience to, I, to, to myself when um, the book that the White Earth turned into, uh, The Lost Girls, was published. It was sw swept up in this crime genre, mystery genre, yes. much to your surprise, correct? Much to my surprise. In fact, yes. Yes. I mean, I, I marketed that sold the 
got my agent calling it some kind of hodgepodge of literary upmark women's fiction, which <laughs> I had cobbled together from various articles I'd read on Google. Um, never in any of my query letters did I mention mystery, crime, anything <laughs> like that. And, and then when it was sold, they started marketing it as a mystery or, and, and to my great shock, a thriller. Because yeah, well, that's a designation that's a little questionable. It's a kind of catch-all. It's um, a thriller. But yeah, it goes into that mystery thriller pool, and there it is. So as you, I, it's, I sort of remember we did an event for the Lost Girls at, um, uh, at um, Chevalier's here in LA, and I remember you were working on this book, um, because you were going out to Nevada afterwards. Speaking about second books, how much... How aware were you, if at all, that you were going to write another crime novel? How did, did you approach this book with that in mind? You know, yeah, with this one, much more so. Um, the first one, you know, the impetus was around, yeah, it was a family saga talking about how the sins of one generation cast these long shadows that go forward up four or five generations. And that's what I was really digging into. But after kind of swimming around in the mystery slash thriller pond for a while, I decided that I liked it there. Yeah. <laughs> so I thought, you know, it is actually a pretty raw and interesting way to tell a story. If someone is dead, if someone has been murdered, died violently, it just opens up all these or missing. covered yeah, doors. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 And so the, and the idea for the second book came when I had heard um, a friend of mine talking about a documentary that she had seen um, that's called Love and Terror on the Howling Plains of Nowhere. Hmm. And it's about um, a math teacher at a junior college whose body is found burned outside of this little tiny town in Nebraska. And she was telling me about this documentary and how she loved it and she wanted to win this prize that she was judging. And I just, you know, stopped listening right after she said math teacher burned in the <laughs> in the woods. So I was like, okay, that's cool. That's horribly specific and awful. And I'm going to write a book about a math teacher who gets set on fire and killed. And so then it automatically is a mystery slash thriller because the this this dead person and why and how he died is the is the engine of the plot. And and yeah, I mean it's funny. Um I my friend Steph Cha describes my books as like a book that uses crime as an engine, not yes. as like, you know, and I feel like this is the same thing you have at play here. Um, it's funny also, I, my last book was also inspired by watching a documentary. Um, possibly because, you know, I know, isn't that weird? I possibly yeah. think because I don't have a crimey mind, I have to like draw like from I, somewhere I, else. There's enough crime in the world that should be stolen for our plot. Right. I don't I, need to and it. truly people, <laughs> actual people, think of much more interesting ways to kill other people than I could ever come up with. So yeah. yeah. In the books, they're it. like, yeah, it's yeah, it's good <laughs> to draw from the real world. Yeah. Um, also, you can always research, like, how does that really work? As opposed to, you know, never look at a crime writer's Google search. <laughs> no, no, no. The Google search from this book would just get me arrested. <laughs> yeah, might as well like <laughs> How do prostitutes talk? <laughs> um, so when start, I mean, I know how hard it was for me writing Wonder Valley, which was like the second crime novel. My editor at that point was like, just make something mysterious happen at the beginning, then you can do whatever you want, which is sort of what it seems that you did here, you know? Yeah. But there are certain things in the genre you did a very, like a very traditional job of nodding to. Like what elements of the genre were you, did you sort of struggle to incorporate what came easily? Well, I knew what I did not want to incorporate. Um, and that was the police procedural. I was going to guess. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a detective. It <laughs> is just not ever going to be my thing. I, I, I'm not, I, I like to read them. I love to read them. Mm -hmm. I don't have the interest in researching and learning how police departments solve crimes. I'm not interested in forensics that way. I'm certainly not interested in worrying about whether somebody's violating the Fourth Amendment if they do this, that, or the other thing. So I knew that even though I was going to have this dead guy, I needed to figure out a way to tell the story of solving that crime without involving a whole lot of police. Mm -hmm. So it was more about how do I just ditch a couple of the tried and true aspects of the mystery slash thriller than how did I lean into them? I mean, I guess you could say I leaned into the kind of amateur sleuth side yeah. of the genre. Yeah, but you did work around that. It didn't seem, there. It, it felt very satisfying in the sense that like, 
you have a character who sort of reminds me of Harry Truman in Twin Peaks, the sort of <laughs> Yahoo out in the woods who is tangentially associated with crime solving and yeah. who's more like, you use his character so much more interesting than police work. So he sort of satisfies both sides of that, you know? Right, right. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I find the, um, I also love, well, you're a lawyer, so you do know more about crime solving than I would think the average person would, or, well, you're not that well, I, I was an antitrust lawyer, so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> if you want to, you know, form a monopoly and fix prices, I'm going to know all about it. But I feel like I've read that thriller. <laughs> <laughs> those thrillers sell, though, those, like, you know, financial... <laughs> <laughs> but I will never read them. They just give me a headache. <laughs> it's funny. You know, that leads me to another question. Like, a lot of the stuff, um, you know, in this book seems a little far afield from interests that I would commonly associate, you know, things that you would be interested in. Um, mm -hmm. I hope I'm not overstepping by guessing. No, not at all. That. Um, you, um, you know, w one of the big set, one of the big things in the book is, um, you know, the meth um, crises in um, yeah, the opioid America. Crisis, yeah. um, mm -hmm. And you do it really well without making it, it you have a very human hu take on it. It's not sort of this giant belabored crisis. How did you, um, A, how did you, I mean, it's pretty, how did you learn about that? And how did you decide to create that way, you know, use these characters as a way to explore, you know, the methamphetamine crisis? Yeah, um, and actually this is once again going to show me as a person who's not really into deep dive research. <laughs> I did a lot of research, <laughs> much more than I ever wanted to do in terms of opioid addiction, how it works medically, and how people, I mean, I've visited places on the web that that you would never want to go. They oh. involve people talking about, you know, how they can manage their lives and their heroin addictions at the same time, because they don't want to give up the heroin, but they don't want to die. So right. these long, these huge chat rooms of people trying to figure out how to cope with this addiction and try to think of it as though they're taking medication to get through their days. I mean, it's a, it, it, was, it was very fascinating. And so of course that aspect of it interested me a lot more yeah. than the business side of it, which is where do these drugs come from? Who are the cartels? Um, what's it look like when someone is dealing on the street? And I was able to kind of avoid that businessy side of the research by setting, you know, setting the book in this little tiny town where opioid abuse is rampant, but it's not, the drug isn't distributed in the, in the typical ways that you might see in, in Southern Los Angeles. Right. Or, you know, it, much more people cobbling together sources and resources from, you know, nurses that will write them prescriptions under the table or some guy that, <laughs> that they meet at a park. <laughs> it's, mm -hmm. yeah. So I was able to kind of like, t I, for me, put it in a much more human perspective. I think that's a really interesting way into writing about things. Um, it's like how you might, I mean, not that you're not, you'd be a drug addict, but how you would experience this issue. You know, I, that's how I like to think about things that I don't know or violence or crime. It's like, I can't see it from the top down from this giant law enforcement research perspective, but like yeah. I can organically see it like you did, like from, you know, how would my experience of this be? And that's how it would be. Like you're more or less, if you had to be a character in your book, the math teacher, you know, and like, yeah. how would I have gotten involved in this and how would I have, yeah, right. it's a really and, great. And I, and I went about telling it from the perspective of a child yes. who gets pulled into that business in kind of a sideways sort of way. So to me, that was an even more interesting way to look at it because he's obviously been affected by it in a deeply personal way. Yeah. Um, yeah. He becomes part of it in a way that's also kind of deeply personal and he's watching what's happening around him, seeing these problems that are quite sophisticated, but through the eyes of an 11 slash 12 year old. So that was an interesting way to look at it for me. I think it is so tricky to write from a child's perspective. I just remember my entire writing career from like eighth grade on to graduate school, people are saying, you know, don't do this. Don't write from the elderly. Don't write from a child because you don't know. This is the first time in having finished this book a few days ago that I thought that it, it didn't the least bit bother me or it, it did such a great, it's such a light touch on his child likeness, not his childishness, because he has, he, he doesn't know more than he should. It's just so well done, his character. But I wanted to talk a little bit about one of the devices you use there, which I absolutely love. There are so many for, people, for people out there. Who <laughs> uh, there are so many things in this book that I should never say elevate it past the genre because the crime genre is its own thing and wonderful. Right. Yes. But there are certain things in The Distant Dead that Heather writes about that sort of transcend convention. And, um, oh, I'm sorry, those are my dogs. <laughs> <laughs> 
Okay, um, there are, and one of them, we'll go into all the math. Um, there's a, a, a whole section about, um, not section, a whole um, underlying um, narrative about um, Native American um, culture and architecture and first, uh, archeology span and first people. But the way uh, Sal, who, and I love the names and um, you, you've named those characters so well, this um, off the grid, family, they all have these biblical kind of Mormon fundamentalist <laughs> names. I'm sorry yeah, if I'm offended. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, if you read something like, well, the, you know, a lot, the names are so perfect, but Sal, his real name is Absalom. He has this fantasy world in which he sort of uh, triangulates his anxiety. How did you come up with that? If you could talk a little bit about it and how it's yeah, so brilliant. Um, so my way into this book, uh, once I figured out I was going to write about a dead math teacher who'd been set on fire. And mm -hmm. I already knew that I wanted to set it in this town because I kind of stumbled upon it when driving to my parents' house in Boise from San Francisco and just thought it was a place that a book needed to be set in. Um, I sat down and tried to get into the setting and the place. And I do have a longstanding interest in anthropology and archaeology and the history of the first people and, and when people first set foot in North America, all of that. And there's a deep, deep, deep history of that in the Great Basin um, in Nevada. So the prologue, which is about the boy 15,000 years ago going into a cave, that was a, that was a writing exercise that I did just to kind of soak up the spirit of the land. Because you know, I mean, we both write very deeply from setting, from place. Yeah. And, and so, and this is not a place that I knew the way I knew the setting of my first book. Yeah, so which I you knew in really well. Yeah, so I needed to get the soul of this place. So I wrote that prologue. And at the end of it, I thought, what if I just put this in the book? What if I have this be the prologue of the book? And then I knew I had a young boy character who was going to be involved in the main part of the story. But the way he processes the world and the way he organizes um, his moral questions are this kind of almost spiritual imaginary w uh, way that ties back to the boy in the cave in the prologue. Mm -hmm. So really that prologue and that, that child there helped me develop the character of Sal throughout the book. Okay, and first of all, I'd like eight things to say here, but the prologue should, is one of those things that just shouldn't work, but works so perfectly. I um, so close to taking it out so many times. And then I sent it off to my editor and I was like, <laughs> Her love for my book was also a writing exercise that I was doing to pass time when I was stuck. And I was like, this is fun, you know? And I think this is something I want to talk about in a second, which is like the ways like this, the great thing about crime fiction right now is this flexibility within the genre. But before we get to that, I want to put a little more of a finer point on your um, young Sal character. Um, I know you have kids. Um, and I, I know they're a bit older than I can yeah. remember because yeah. they're old. They're in college. Class. I know your daughter's <laughs> in college. Um, but his like, okay, sorry, I thought I did that. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, his um, Sal's fantasy world is this such a realized like nerdy Dungeons and Dragons. Totally. It's so viscerally real about what he, he's drawing what I wanted to explain is he's drawing these angels all the time like those kids no one talked to in school who are sitting in the back and they're drawing <laughs> Jesus oh my God. Sorry. Oh my God. I'm so sorry. Chevalier's that wasn't, bookstore. That wasn't me, was it? <laughs> no, it's Chevalier's bookstore of all things. Um, In Larchmont? Uh, yeah, they're calling me. Um, I'm so sorry. No, um, I don't right. know how that happens. Um, it's life. <laughs> um, but I really, how do you, but I mean, it, it really inhabits the life of a young boy so um perfectly where did do you is that something from your life or someone you know or is you know, just from is that a mat purely imagined yeah so neither of my children are that type of kid um right. but you know i i sometimes think that like i'm just emotionally arrested at the age of 12 um <laughs> i was a very 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 imaginative child and this would be the kind of thing that i might have come up with it's it's not related to anything i imagined as a child mm. but i was that kind of kid right who, constantly going through life. I mean, I would eat my food at dinner 
and tell myself little stories in my mind about the peas that were on my fork. Like okay. everything was turned into a story or a character. And so getting access to that kind of kid was not that hard. It's really well done. I mean, it's one of those things when you know the author, you're like, which of her kids does this? <laughs> but no, the truth was, it was you. No, <laughs> um, so like I said before, um, there is this new flexibility within the genre of crime fiction, which is to um, draw from outside convention and have things mm -hmm. like, um, you know, characters who imagine sort of fantasy angels or, um, moments of anthropological um, <laughs> po like poetry or math. So right. this book has a lot in it that's like outside the lane of story. Um, how hard was it? So first of all, how hard was it to to put all, what came first, the story or these things? Yeah. Well, I mean, when I say that the second book was hard to write, Oh. I am really talking a lot about that, that I had so many, you know, saucers I was juggling in the air, um, the math and the anthropology. The anthropology was the easiest part because I already know a lot about that. Right. Everything else took research. And um, I, I, I don't, I think I remember you saying at an event once that you're not somebody who really has a detailed outline for your stories. Yeah, that's right. Where you write them. And I am like that. I I knew what the story was about, and so I knew what the ending was going to be. Everything else is just groping through the slush in the middle. Do you mean the ending, like the beginning of the math teacher burning, or who did it? Well, um, who did it did kind of, did change, but not by that much. Um, but I did, yeah, I did know that. Okay, yeah, so that's the end, yeah. So, yeah. And I feel like I do kind of have to know that when I'm writing, but I don't have to know anything in the middle. It's just going to be a brutal slog to get there. And you're going to be like, oh my God, this guy needs to be like, um, you know, he's the protege of the math professor. So he's got to be a math genius. So now I have to go learn about math. <laughs> so you have to, okay. Uh, like I, the most I've known about math in my entire life is what I'm teaching my five-year-old downstairs. I've, yes, they carry the one, they now call it regrouping, which is <laughs> hard for me. Um, but do the math, you know, it's so hard to have something in a book like this that's a concept that's not actually tangible. Math is an intangible. And it feels so, I'm just a little bit blindsided that you're not into math or you're not a math person. I'm not into math, but I, I am into, and I watched a, um, a Science Friday, or listened to a Science Friday episode a few years ago where, you know, Ira Flato was talking to this math genius. Mm -hmm. And between the two of them, they're sort of geeking out about how math is a language that you either understand or you don't. You know, right. you, can, you can bounce your checkbook, you can, you know, figure out what the tip is going to be, or you absolutely understand these algorithms and logarithms that are at the high way, the stratosphere yeah. of math. And if you understand them, it's like a language in and of itself. And people who speak that language, they just, they, they, they love to find one another. And listening to them talk, I realized I do not speak that language and I never will. But it was cool to me that there's this like alternative level of thought where people see the world and process it mathematically in a way that I do not. And so I came back to that with this one character who's a literal kind of once in a generation math genius that he just sees the world differently from anybody else. And in, in a way that I even can't explain, but that is hopefully coming through on the page a little bit. Well, it comes through in the page perfectly, but also it sort of reminds me of something. It, it doesn't have to be math. Like there's a language so many people, for some reason I always find myself writing about music and like I know nothing about music, but yeah. there's this idea that there's a method of communication that people share that's like a code or whatever. And it sort of reminds me of something um, I was talking, I, Megan Abbott said when she was writing uh, Give Me Your Hand, which is about mm -hmm. science. And yeah. she was like, I wanted to take my sort of female dynamic books and put it in a science lab but I don't know anything about science but what I figured out was it's the same you know like <laughs> so like you know it's it's the same relationships and like so math I guess is like it's a language whereas you know you yeah. and I can talk about books or you know certain people exactly. can talk about music right. it, 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 and you do it so seamlessly I mean it made me very envious that um, <laughs> well I, I think that is the key though because yeah. I mean, I don't really understand music the way I should, but yeah. I can appreciate it. Right. I don't understand math the way I should, and I do not appreciate it at all. <laughs> I mean, you could quote you me an equation, and I would not be sitting there going, oh, my God, that's music. Can I, can I jump in for just a second? Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, 
Yeah, it's funny because you're talking about uh, you're talking about music, you know, which is math, mm -hmm. in, in a sense, you know. Oh, very um, so. Well, the beginning, the beginning scene sequence where the you know this this boy uh, kind of goes into the underworld, you know, yes. uh, and he has he has this vision, you know, which is very, you know, you read about these sort of vision quest exper experiences, and what he sees is. Um, I mean, you write it, it, it's so beautifully written, you know, where he sees the, the fabric of time, I think you call it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, these billions and billions of dead that have people that have lived before. And it's it, the way you describe it is very mathematical, you know? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, I, uh, right. I'm assuming Sometimes that was, that was no accident. No. Well, I mean, like <laughs> I said, the prologue was the first thing I wrote, but sometimes you just, one thing informs the other. And then sometimes you realize that you have an alchemy going on that you hadn't foreseen, but is working really well. So again, when the math, the math comes into the book, I tweaked the prologue a little bit to, to, to build on that. But I, I do like that symmetry that. Well, the book is all symmetry, symmetrical. Yeah, um, it is. <laughs> the, the book is uh, based on symmetry. Yeah. And so I, I, that's what I kept thinking about was, I, I don't even, the Heinzman equation, Heinzman theory, what's it called? <laughs> Reisman, Reisman. Right, right. And I don't actually, I tried very hard to understand it and was never, ever able to do it. I think that's okay. No, I mean, I think four years trying to figure out what, all I ended up learning was that it's purely theoretical. It has no practical application. And it has a lot to do with like prime numbers and predicting when they will occur going through infinity as it relates to this one Z equation. Useful. <laughs> so well, I'm um, sorry though I can't explain it any better than that. Sometimes, like like you said just now, after Patrick's uh, observation that the introduction had this mathematical element to it, and you start to find I can't remember the word you just used, but I like these coincidences or these things that are actually inherent to the book, the symmetrical experiences of some of your characters. Um, did you know? Th I don't want to give too much away, but there mm -hmm. are. It's like a like a, a a chain that's repeating. Like someone has this experience and it results in this. Then someone has. It. So did you know that, or was that one of those amazing things when you're writing? You're like, oh my god. Like, this kind of, kind of a little bit of both. I mean, I I think the overarching, if there's like a cosmic theme of the book, it is that you know these things do happen over and over again. That time is vast and enormous, and human experience is limited. And so the things people encounter in their lives happen to other people and different people at other times and it's and it gives us our our common humanity but at the same mm -hmm. time in each of our individual experiences of it it's deeply profound if you step back like the boy in the cave and everybody's just a little point of light it's yeah. it, it's not it's significant in a different way but every one of those little points of light is experiencing tragic loss and all the things that the characters do so yeah there's this kind of wide angle small angle lens Mm -hmm. and there's also there's, there's, there's also technical. something that comes in that where it's like the, the importance of a, of some sort of almost a spirit guide yeah you know, kind of pull you that I, I don't want to spoil things and give too much away but uh, <laughs> that definitely plays into the book you know uh, someone who kind of yeah. guides him through yeah. right and, and I, about, I wanted to talk to you about this because like you hit on it a little bit earlier but this question of like narrative voice and point of view and how you know you started out with philia and and you had to learn the rhythm and the pattern of the 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 way people in in south south l a talk the prostitutes mm -hmm. your narrator is a third person narrator um, narrating in the present tense. Mm -hmm. My narrator is a third person narrator na narrating generally in the past tense, but how did you and how do you because I wrestled with this quite a bit figure out like who that narrator is. Like, I'm going to tell you right now who I think your narrator is. No, like no, you tell me. Telling the whole story? <laughs> me. <Yeah. laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, yes, but like, so you're speaking through the voice of, to me, reading your book, the voice that's narrating it is written by you, but it's the voice of the neighborhood speaking, like the neighborhood itself. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, yes, definitely. Yeah. And in my book, the narrator, the perspective, the point of view is kind of this vast kind of entity that can see the whole broad sweep of time, but yeah. also has the empathy to kind of zero in on, on people very closely. It's but that's funny. Like a long time to get right. 
Well, what sort of I was struck by with your book is um, I had read, um, well, I, you know, I also wrote a book set in the desert, as you know, and uh, I could never, it's, it's so awful when like, someone tells you the thing that you wrote about. I'm like, oh, yeah. Uh, so I, um, Jonathan Lethem also wrote a book set in the desert, and, and they're very similar, oddly. Um, and he was like, I'm writing to grapple with the desert's uh, incommensurability. And I was like, oh, that's what I wrote too. But that's what I feel like what you're talking about, narrative uh, perspective is like, it's it's hard to understand your place in this vastness and the you know this like this like cosmic reckoning of being this small speck in this large land. Right. Um, but speaking of small specks and large lands, um, you have this talent of Lovelock, which um, I remember is real. And you know, you we had this discussion when you were writing it. You're going out there, and I was absolutely like flabbergasted that because <laughs> I can only write about literally what's outside my window. Like actually, <laughs> literally, I have no idea what I'm going to do next. I mean, because of quarantine, I might be writing about that guy's house over there. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> <laughs> be great. Um, but you'd gone to this other place and you were, you know, on your way to Idaho. Um, and uh, how hard was it to really feel comfortable writing and sort of digging into a place that wasn't, you know, yours? Not in my backyard and not outside my experience. Yeah. Um, yeah, that was, that was hard. Um, I may not do that again. <laughs> I mean, you never know. Are very proprietary of places, you yeah, know. I definitely love to set stories in small towns, just like you like to set them in mm -hmm. kind of gritty urban neighborhoods. And you know, we have our little sandboxes that we like, so to speak. Yeah. Um, I need to was... move. <laughs> <laughs> or you're going to set another story there. There's like a million stories you can set, right? Probably that guy's house. I'm not kidding. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, what's he building in there? I know. What's he building? I love that documentary. <laughs> <laughs> um, but in your, so in Lovelock, so how much time did you spend there? I was there probably four separate times for about between three and 10 days each time. And I would just go and stay at the Cadillac Inn for like $19.99 a night with no Wi-Fi. <laughs> I mean, it's exactly what you would expect great. in this gritty little desert town. Mm -hmm. And I would just wander around going to, I took hikes out in the desert and I went into the shops and I you know, went to dinner and went to the bars. And I, I didn't tell people I was researching a book because I feel like that just changes the whole conversation. Yeah, that's probably a good move. <laughs> yeah, so I would just be really nosy and say, hey, you know, did you grow up here? And like, da, 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 and just tease out people's stories. Because to me, a place like that is fascinating because yeah. of the fact that people live there. I mean, this is a terrible thing to say about a town that I'm slandering here on. Um, no, I get what you're saying. You know, like the, the people stay there, but they have, it turns out, very good and valid reasons for staying there. They have family, they have history, everybody knows them, they feel safe in that way. There's also people who can't wait to get out as well. But it's hard. So what fascinated me a little bit about Lovelock was that Lovelock was the big city compared to the like, mm -hmm. like I don't know, what do you want to call it? The boonies of Marzen. Marzen? Yeah. <laughs> Mars is not real, though. I looked it up on a map. Mars is not real. I made that up. Okay, I spent some time searching for it. Um, I'm so sorry. <laughs> that's fine. Um, and But I feel it's a realistic relationship. Mars is where the kids are bussed in. They have people who are living off the grid. I love off the grid stories. It's sort of my, one of my favorite genres. Everything from, you know, await your reply to 4th of July Creek. Like, I'm 100% for, here for your off the grid fiction. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And I think that it's really easy to portray people off the grid as insane libertarians, but your character, especially of Gideon, is really, really even-handed. You treat him really kindly, and, you know, we're not all here to shoot holes in nickels and overthrow the government. They're just people who... I, I do think it's great, but I do love this dichotomy of Marzen and um, Lovelock as, like, the big city, little city, but and also just the different ways that you um, created the bar scenes in both of them. They're a little bit different. Like in yeah. the Lovelock <laughs> bars, it's like you get the society of <laughs> school teachers who are jib-jabbing about, you know, PTA right, gossip, or whatever, gossip, right? Bars and it's yeah. all yeah. like gossip news and like, um, you know, bad, bad times. Um, how was that fun to write those bar scenes? Those bar scenes were very fun to write. Yes. Yes. I mean, you could just picture, you know, the teacher with her, the divorcee with her high heels and her black leather skirt. And it just, yeah, it was, that was, those were fun. <laughs> so um, are you here to stay in the genre of crime fiction? <laughs> I'm just going to ask you what I, I get asked all the time. <laughs> I know. Um, well, I remember you telling me Wonder Valley was not a crime story. And I, 
It's not. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Yet you win all these awards in the, in the mystery genre. So like maybe <laughs> we think we leave it and we really don't. So who can say? Um, I heard that in The Godfather once, but I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> You're not allowed to leave. <laughs> I, I think I'm going to stay for a while at least. I really think that, you know, it's funny because we went to this fancy graduate school where they try to like, you know, it's the place where they try to teach you, they teach really great basics of writing, but you and I were both in this weird position where we came out as sort of more genre-y writers and the yeah. was a little bit looked down upon, I would say. But I think the, te the tenet of all good genre fiction is story. And like in our workshop with Alice Madison, the first thing she said, and I remember this all the time because I have pet rabbits, is release a lot of rabbits, have a lot to chase down. And I'm like, what better than the opening of, let's say, The Distant Dead, where you've got a burning math teacher right. in a secondary town. Like, what? This is, this is the ultimate expression of what it is to start a story off well. And this genre should no longer, I, I think it's starting to emerge from like the literary ghetto. Yeah, I think so too. And I think it is that advantage of like, you walk into, when you're writing in that genre, mm -hmm. you, you have your engine. Your engine, yeah. you know, you, you know what, it's, what kind of engine it's going to be. And yes. that is helpful to someone like me who has a hard time coming up with engines. Me too. Um, but, but, but what I really love to do is once I've got my engine is play around with character mm -hmm. and setting and personal choices and theme and morality, just like you. So I'm perfectly happy to throw my story over the workhorse of crime fiction for as long as it will carry That's me. That's a really great way to put it. I think like crime is a really great scaffold or backbone or yep. whatever you want to say mm -hmm. to explore community or retribution or, you know, a lot of stories, especially in the literary genre, which I'm not going to really slander too much here, but like <laughs> a lot of literary stories about retribution, like it's something that's sort of distant in the background, you know, but in crime fiction, what you are overcoming is quite present, you know, um, and it sort of brings a nice immediacy to the story, which um, as a crime gives everyone something to react to, like it allows the... Right, right. Right, and um, I remember one of the things they told us at Bennington, I know Alice said this many times, was- um, But writing the first and third person. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but you know, she's like, put your character up in a tree and throw a bunch of rocks at them. And yeah. she, when we graduated, <laughs> she sat me down and she said, I've lost all faith in you. I said, what? After two years, you've lost faith in me? And she said, I don't think you're gonna be able to actually hurt your characters. And I was like, you just watch me. I'm gonna go hurt my characters bad. <laughs> Watch me throw rocks. I'm going to throw boulders. Know, like, this character is going to be suffering so badly. And, and you know, when there's, when there's a crime, your characters suffer a yeah. lot. Because a crime often in a community, like a crime doesn't often exist in a vacuum. It, it's like, it, it's, it's at, a, at the end of a history. Like, so what's going on in your book, it's not just immediate. It's the result of this. And you actually expounded to 15,000 years, you know. In the yeah, past. yeah, yeah, yeah. And <laughs> that like the, hurting your character is hurting your characters isn't a, like a self-standing event it's a compounding right. effect of like a lot of different crimes right. um right. in a multi-perspective book which i love to write because i think it's much easier <laughs> I, know, <laughs> there's, I know there's always that character you like the most and that character you like the least was there one of those here? not like the least in oh terms no of i love them all they're all fantastic no to write, to write. <laughs> yeah so the sal was my favorite character to write Oh, and how would I have thought the hardest? Oh, great. That's oh, the hardest one. Okay, so Sal no, no, Sal's the, the great. I found like I would have thought that'd be the hardest. It's awesome, but, but well, he was also the hardest because oh, okay. yeah, which is maybe why he was my favorite because I ended up having to spend so much time trying to think about him. Mm -hmm. I mean, I haven't written a, a male character's perspective before, and so really? even though no, like even though he's a boy, um, you know, a pretty prepubescent boy, I'm still inhabiting the mind of a of a male character. So that was a little tricky. And then the adolescent part of it and just his whole, mm. he, he was, it was difficult to get him right. But by the end, I, I, he was my favorite to, to work with. Was there one that was really hard to write? Um, I wouldn't say hard. So Jake, the character up who lives up in Mars. Another male character. Yeah, he, he was hard for me to make real because he started out like all my characters basically start out as plot devices or like very shallow <laughs> versions of themselves and, <laughs> and then they get more complex as you write he mm. was necessary because i needed a narrative perspective in marzen that wasn't sal's so yeah. he was he served a very important function in the book really and like at the same time he wasn't going to be part of the main story 
Mm-hmm. So giving him enough flesh on his bones, he doesn't have that many perspective chapters, but I didn't want them to be completely flat. So he ended up being this kind of avatar for the kind of person who absolutely loves where they grew up and would never think yeah. of anything. And that became, made him more interesting to me, but he, I would say, was the most challenging. I was really worried he and Nora were going to get married. Oh, that was never going to happen. Yeah, I actually <laughs> will probably never write a romance in my novels. <laughs> oh my God, me neither. This was like not happening. <laughs> Um, I have another question. Um, I did check on your website a few hours ago, um, mm-hmm. books I wish I had written, but the link is broken. Oh, it is? Oh, tragically, I'll have to go fix it. Yeah, so <laughs> I was wondering, I've looked at it before, but I was wondering, what are a few of those currently? Uh, well, they aren't all in there, but like, um, this is a recent creation on my website because I right. felt like it needed, I don't know, I've always wanted to do this, to write little pieces about the books that I read and love and talk about them from like, um, almost like a craft perspective. Because one of the things we did at Bennington was you would read books to learn. And that was a new way to read books for me. So I still read books that way. And so if I learn a lot from a book and and then I I will write a little piece about it. So I've only written two of them. (laughs) Um, What are they? Oh God, now I'm gonna blank and forget. Um, What's the one, the one about the fire? It's not little fires everywhere. Oh. Anyway, I don't know. I'm sorry, I can't remember. It's because I'm 55 and I can't think straight most of the time. (laughs) I always wish I'd written Await Your Reply by Dan Sean. I I think this guy probably thinks I'm some insane stalker because I've said this so many times. (laughs) I wish I'd written that book. Yeah, I'm I'm a huge fan of of anything by Marilyn Robinson. And she and I do not write the same kinds of books at all. But I, I I would trade her for oeuvre for my <laughs> have you guys have you guys come across a writer named willie Vla- vlauten oh my god i love <laughs> willie vlauten the free is one of my favorite books of all time what brilliant is book isn't it oh yeah. my gosh yeah the I love free, that book too oh i yes actually i um i blurb the free um and willie vlauten's in a band the um what are they, the yeah. lines they're great yeah. um Yes, actually, this the distant dead and the free do have some things in common, um, which is interesting. I lo- the free is the free is and uh, lean on Pete, right? He's great. Um, and the new one is set in uh, in uh, partly in Nevada, in Tonopah, uh, ah. different different oh, part of the state. Idea. But uh, it, my first book, no one read, is also set in Tonopah. So just oh, like- really? <laughs> I read your first book. Don't go read it. <laughs> it, read it. Read it. It, it opens in tone. Don't look it up. It's also <laughs> set in tone. It opens in tone. Really, up. really good. But it's not. It's not what you write now, for sure. Um, Willie Vlauten is incredible. Um, and uh, he, uh, the, the just the free is a really important book because it's a. It's a book about nurses, and he's obsessed with nurses. And especially right now with what's going on here, I feel like people should oh, yeah. read the free because it's a really important book about nurses. Um, I actually also wish I'd written the free when it comes down to it. <laughs> I feel like I could only wish I'd written books that I could have written. Like I can't wish I'd written. Like, oh, something. yeah, yeah. I, I'm willing to just aspire to books like <laughs> when yours right. <laughs> Can I ask the dumb, horrible question? Are you working on anything else now? Well. Um, Tech, yes. Uh, I haven't actually started writing it, but I have spent most of the pandemic when my mind is is kind of at uh, an ADHD overdrive, mm-hmm. doing some preliminary research because that feels like all I can handle. Yeah. Um, but the the next book will be set in yet another small town. Oh, where? In Iowa. Um, have you been there? I yes. <laughs> <laughs> based on the town where my dad grew up. Oh, cool. And it, I'm going to set it um, during World War II, kind of on the home front. And there will be there will be murder. So speaking of your dad, um, I met your dad one or two times, or maybe even three, at VoucherCon, which yeah. is, for those of you who don't know, the world's largest crime fiction festival. Um, it's been canceled. Which has been canceled this year, like really early. It seems yeah. a little extreme. But, um, uh, and the fact that you bring your dad there makes, he is a big crime fiction fan, right? Huge crime fiction fan, yes. What does he like to read? Um, so he, he he really likes kind of period um, crime fiction that's kind of particularly around World War One. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. So, God, like what's uh, I'm scanning my shelves to see? Charles Todd is a big favorite. Do you um, think that that influenced you at all trying to write? Well, so he had in he has a library like this and. Yeah. He, 
when, when I was growing up, I would wander in there and he had like every kind of Tolstoy, Dostoevsky, the whole Dickens thing. And then he had this whole set of shelves that were just paperback pulp crime novels, like yeah. them and all of them. And I would just go in there and read them. So, yeah. I mean, I did, did just absorb those books in my youth. It's funny. I, I also, like, as we said earlier, had no aspirations to be a crime writer, but I read a ton of crime novels growing up, like, and one of what I read, like, five Tony Hillerman novels one year, which sort of is, you know, something I read, I read them too, yes, yeah. You just yeah. wrote the crime novels set in Nevada. It's like, I think <laughs> this stuff gets inside of you, you know, we had this tiny guest bedroom at our house and it was just like we're all the pulp my parents were literary people so like the pulp novels were like relegated <laughs> there and I, I was i was an insomniac kid so i'd go in there and like read you know ann perry elizabeth peters Tony oh yeah elizabeth peters, dick francis i read like all oh, of I dick did not read <laughs> Walu and his mush i, like horses, so I liked my books <laughs> um, i just wonder how ingrained these things get because they're such great stories and like yeah. I find them, you know, there, there's like, one of the things I love about your book is it doesn't have that moment that I sort of dread in all crime novels when they solve it. You know, I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah. <gasps> like I know what's going to happen next week. They're going to solve it. I'm going to stop caring. When you build such a well-rounded novel where the ideas transcend the plot or just the plot is so strong that it just, the ideas can sort of right. bounce well, off of it and exist. The, the solving of it becomes nice, but irrelevant. And you do such a great job of that. I find that one of the great letdowns of crime fiction is the moment we know who did it. I would like the story to continue because I care about like the people around it. Right, but you know what I hate even more? It's <laughs> <a> critique <laughs> of modern crime fiction is when I didn't see it coming because they pulled a twist out of the hat at the very end that mm. doesn't, that feels, that is manipulative and unfair. Like, oh really, mm. the, the yeah. narrator was the killer the whole time and could have told us this at any point, <laughs> but did not. And mm -hmm. like things like that, if they're yeah. not done well, <laughs> I just throw the book against the wall. Like that's just, that's just cheating, I think. <laughs> so, you should be surprised, but you should feel fairly surprised. Yeah, you can't have a deus ex machina crime solution. Um, so I also feel a little guilty of this, but like someone, I had to take a crash course in modern crime and I read a lot, you know, <laughs> Lot <laughs> over the past seven years, ten years. <laughs> what uh, crime novels or mystery novels have you read that you love or that you're reading now that are just fantastic? Well, I'm a huge fan of Tana French. Um, mm. I mean, even though they're police procedurals, they're so. Yeah. I just ignore that part. Like, I, it's just all about the characters. Um, so you know, Tana French. I I was a big Elizabeth George fan for a long mm -hmm. time. Um, Kate Atkinson. Yeah. Or Lippman. I mean, I like, I like the books like, like you write that are, that are really about character. And, well, one of the things yeah. I love about Tana French, or Tana, I don't really say it, and um, Kate Atkinson is, especially Tana French's books, I feel like I'm learning about Dublin because each book switches to a different yeah. perspective of someone else in that yeah. police station, the murder squad. So then you're like, one, one's an affluent detective and then one's a working class detective. So the way right. they see Dublin is totally different. So she's creating yeah. this amazing document of like, like 2000s Dublin that I think is might actually be a very important historical document. When I agree with you. I think, yeah, like she's really writing the, um, the biography of her city. Yeah, it's From amazing. a perspective that no one else ever really ever sees. But that's the work of crime fiction. That's what Michael Connolly is doing. That's what Walter Mosley is doing. You know, this crime fiction is a way to write the biography. Yes. Especially if you pick a city and then you just stay there and you, you a, a big enough city will off, offer enough opportunities to tell a story, to tell hundreds of different I'm stories. hoping because I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> Have, are there questions from the audience that we should be taking? Uh, no, you know what? We've had some kind of, glitch with our Facebook thing. So oh, I really, wow. yeah. I've been getting I, I, a billion texts saying, I can't get in, I can't get in, oh, I can't get in. There's something oh. wrong with, but tell them not to fear because we're also recording it on Zoom. Okay. And okay. so I'll, I'll post the whole thing right afterwards. Oh, um, okay. But uh, no, it's funny you mentioned that. I, you know, we're talking about crime fiction and how, you know, uh, I really admire sort of the a combination of real highbrow and real lowbrow, you know, kind of where it all comes together. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that at its best, you know, crime fiction really can show you what's going on in the, in the country, you know, kind of at a street level, 
in yeah. a way that literary yeah. fiction, if it's good, can too. But you know, crime fiction has an energy about it that you don't. You know, I don't need to read another story about the angst of the white professor and you know the Ivy League campus yeah. kind of environment. Yeah. Um, but right. I, I'm I'm totally with you. You know about uh, uh, I like kind of the realistic crime novel more as a way of showing sort of the ripple effects of crime and how it affects people rather than, you know, the who done it and right. but you know, everybody comes to it, you know, has different right. tastes and things like that. Right. And, that I'm, and, and for that reason, you know, I'm pretty sure I will never set a murder at a country club or a high rise, you know, high rise condo complex. Okay. I, I like crime stories that are set in different kinds of communities where everybody lives a little bit on edge on the margin. And so something violent like this threatens a lot more than just someone's emotional well-being. Yeah. Can I mean, you talk a little bit about, about Nora too? Cause we really haven't gotten into her too much. And I think she's really yeah. interesting character and she's the one who kind of escaped for a while, you know, she yeah. got, and, but then came back. Um, yeah. Was she, yeah. was she a tricky character to write? She was a little bit, yeah. I mean, I knew I wanted to have this character that was trapped in her town because I liked the dichotomy of, here's this math professor who has a professorship at Reno. And then he walks away from that and goes to Lovelock to teach middle school. Like mm -hmm. he wanted to be there or something. And Nora went to Reno to try to, to, to get a graduate degree in anthropology and had to come back and teach middle school and didn't want to be there at all. So that, like, I liked how they sparked off each other, their different experiences that way. Um, so, you know, I, I wanted to develop her as that kind of character, someone who, who could look at him and really want to know what made him tick because it was so different from her own experience with her own town. Right. And a lot of these, you know, these characters are dealing with, you know, a lot of loss, you know, yes. yeah. a lot of loss. Yeah. And um, are you sympathetic? And I, Again, I always spoil things, so I'm trying not to do that. But uh, Nora and I thought the scenes with Nora and her father were really mm. interesting and well done. And um, did you find yourself ultimately sympathetic to her father? Yes, I did. Okay. And yeah. I, 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 across, that comes across very clearly. Yeah, I mean, I, I wanted him, I always want my, my, he's not a villain, but like, you know, he, 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 he didn't need to have as much humanity as I wanted to give him. Um, you know, yeah, I wanted him to be someone, I wanted him to be someone that you could understand why she loved him. That he had done this thing and ruined her life and ruined her brother, ended her brother's life. And yet she would still feel deep affection for him. So I felt like I had to build that in, like what their bond was like, what he was like as this tragically weak person, but who was still a good person at heart. Yeah, I, I, I but stronger than some other people in the book. So exactly. like, exactly, and that I mean, was, that was I an think interesting. It's such thing. an important thing to look for that moment of humanity and that possibility for redemption for everybody. Because yeah. like, barring writing about soci sociopaths and psychopaths, which is like pretty trite, um, I think there is the, you know everyone has that possibility for redemption in the future, yeah. and I think that's something you've laid in really well for all these characters, especially your father, and that relationship was fascinating to me as well. Um, you know, yeah. I yeah. feel like, yeah, I feel like she has forgiven him in her own way, but she just is in this rut of guilt and this rut of her life and doesn't quite like that's the way yeah. she exists in the world. But Right. I think she has taken into herself a fair amount of the blame for what happened, mm -hmm. for leaving, right. and leaving them alone. Um, so even though while she blames him, I think she also blames herself. And so I think that gives her the way forward to a better understanding of him or... Right. The, the way that the, the, you know, the way that their relationship resolves in the end without spoilers. <laughs> One thing I, I guess uh, to kind of start to wrap it up, but I, mm -hmm. there are a few questions I want to ask both of you. Um, uh, Heather, in the book, you know, the Prentice, the Prentice clan, as it were, you know, goes back many generations and you kind of mm -hmm. touch a little bit of, on that. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that reading the book, uh, A, the prose seemed to be a perfect match for the landscape, it seemed to be very spare and very carefully, you know, chiseled uh, in a way. Mm -hmm. Very beautiful and very appropriate for the book. Um, and also, as you're reading it, you get a sense of, just as you were saying, you know, this this thing that we call time, 
is uh, is such an illusion. And it's so you know we're here today and gone tomorrow, and you and you get a sense that 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 frontier era. And I'm going to segue into Ivy here in a second. We've been talking. <laughs> we've like, been oh, talking oh, about this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. We've been talking about this. Um, you know, uh, I just saw something in the news about. Uh, you know, a 110 year old, the oldest living World War II vet. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I've been going through some stuff with my dad, who his grandfather was a soldier, blah, blah, blah. And you think that, you know, within his grandfather's living memory, you know, we're not very far away is what I'm trying to say from the frontier era. We really aren't. Right. We're not. And, no. um, we're well and, within you know, the, the reach of oral histories for sure. And actual uh, histories. Yeah, absolutely. Sure. And, um, uh, Ivy, I know you've been kind of soaking up all this material, historical stuff. Um, is some is an idea kind of starting to form in your mind of what you'd like to do? For me, about the front. Yeah. Well, um, okay, so it's a little bit not quite the frontier, though that is exactly what I'm reading about. I'm reading a lot of Western uh, novels right now. Oh, I read a ton of Westerns when I was a kid, too. Yeah. Really? I've just I started. Um, but yeah, I love I them. I just read, um, what's it called? Um, by um a butcher's crossing um anyway i feel like there's a violence in our culture that and crime fiction has like bears the brunt of violence but western novels are really violent and i feel like there's something about this moment that reminds me of western frontier fiction um especially living in la just like lawlessness and um, every, every person for themselves kind of yeah yeah, yeah. and uh, you know I don't know, reshaping the world in the way that you see fit. I don't know why, um, but what I'm really interested in Westerns is um, uh, these stories have always been male stories. And I feel like women are not allowed to be violent in fiction. And I'm like, yeah. Why not? <laughs> you know, like, I'm sorry, you know. I feel like women are very, very um, trod upon in fiction. Like I was right, thinking about the, movie the, victims, the other yeah. day, like the Al Pacino, Robert De Niro movie. I'm like, yeah. you would never see women act like that because we're not allowed to act like that. It's like, that's a real type of Western right. ideology, like a face off. Right. But um, again, this idea of incommensurability, like we don't understand the world we live in and the Western novel sort of takes that in its scope. Like this yeah. world is bigger than we are. And I feel like the Western and the crime novel are cousins. They're I find definitely cousins. I was just gonna say cousins, yeah. Well, yeah. I mentioned in an email to you, Charles Portis, you know, I mean, yeah. What a wonderful writer. writer. My husband's favorite yeah. writer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Portis, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I find that area, I find that that era, and it's somewhat underrepresented, especially in crime fiction, um, because crime fiction, as we know it, was being invented. Um, but that, that era where the frontier is giving away to modernity, mm -hmm. I find a really interesting period, you know, like, mm -hmm you know, 1890s to 1910, maybe? Yes. Before, yeah. before the 20s. Yeah. Uh, uh, in, pre -noir. In yeah, That's right. Pre-noir, pre -noir, exactly. Yeah. Well, it's where the Western yeah. is becoming noir. Yeah, exactly. You know, where the, the Western hero becomes, you know, the uh, Sam Spade or becomes, and also that, uh, I can really nerd out on this stuff, but, uh, you know, Dashiell <laughs> Hammett, you know, working, <laughs> That's why we're here. <laughs> you know, Hammett working as a Pinkerton, during yeah. that period in the early labor history of the West, which kind of plays into what you're talking about and that you're, you're part of Nevada that you write about. Um, yeah, it's fascinating. Yeah, fascinating. I, I, I agree. And trying to think like, who are the, who are the people writing in the Western genre today? Um, I mean, I just finished reading Paulette Giles. Oh yeah, uh, I love her. Yeah, and, and those, really books, her. those books are Western novels. They're not, steeped in violence the way some Western novels right. are, but they're set in that time, uh, that, that that changing of the pendulum over from the wild, wild west to the civilized west, like the trains are just starting to arrive and newspapers are starting to, to show up. There are, a couple, there are a couple I could recommend. Um, I think Philip Joe Meyer Lamb. kind of writes in that mm -hmm. genre, although he's yeah. not writing right now. Who's that? Philip Meyer. Sort of oh yeah, The, the Sun. That mm -hmm. was a terrific book. And American Rust is a Western. Although yes, that's novel. true. Yep. Mm -hmm. Joe Lansdale yeah. is a really good writer who writes uh, in the West. Do you know his stuff at all? No. Joe Lansdale, mm -hmm. excellent. Uh, Lauren Epstelman. Yeah. James Carlos Blake, who I've been recommending. To yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, someone's been telling me about him I'll too. I'll get them from you. I'll organize yeah, them. We will. <laughs> yeah. well, I'll send you a care package, maybe with some slot can and some other <laughs> weird stuff. 
<laughs> well, we digress. Uh, yeah. But thanks so much, you guys, for, for agreeing to do Everyone's this today. Everyone buy Heather's oh. book. It's terrific. And not yeah. just, you know, it's, it's okay. I'll buy Ivy's, which looks like this. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you both so much. And uh, congratulations on the publication of the book, Heather. Thank you very uh, much. And best of luck with it. I think I think you've signed all of our books. Uh, I did, yeah. So if anybody wants to thing. get a signed one, um, Poison Pen is the place to get it. We don't have very many left, everybody. So they're, they're going fast. Oh, wow, I've been, that's I've awesome. been, I've been touting them, so. <laughs> well, I've, I've been pimping both of your books. So uh, <laughs> thanks again, guys. I really appreciate it. I think they call that it. passionate hand selling. In yes, your, I think they do. I mean, is that what they you know, call it? pimping, passionate hand selling. I've heard it was passionate hand selling. <laughs> they would say a diesel bookstore. We would passionately hand selling your book. <laughs> yes, that's right. Yes. <laughs> okay. Always All a right. pleasure. Always a pleasure. Thank you. Very nice to meet you, Patrick. You too, Heather. Love to make it to Scottsdale someday in the new I'm world. <laughs> yeah. All right, guys. All right. Have Bye. a great rest of the day. Bye-bye. Okay, you too. Bye.